Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is LJ Shen Feilerman. Uh, I'll be your host for tonight's event. Um, I was honored to be selected for the Best of Festival Award for the 2020 Arlington International Film Festival Student Division, and I'm so excited to be here tonight. Welcome to the 12th Annual Arlington International Film Festival's Poster Contest Award Reception. So before we begin the program, I'd like to recognize Carl Romero, who's been playing some wonderful music for us tonight. He's a nationally acclaimed guitarist who's had a prolific career playing with some of the greatest Latin singers and big bands. Please join me in giving Carl a warm round of applause. So tonight we have gathered to celebrate creativity in illustration and design, and more importantly, to celebrate the work of the artists from Mass College of Art. We'd like to extend a special welcome to our judges. I'd also like to welcome George Summers Jr., our special guest, Robert Maloney, professor of illustration at Mass College of Art and Design, and his students who, are, who participated in this year's poster competition and whom we will meet later in today's program. And lastly, we'd like to thank the Watertown Savings Bank, who's our sponsor, and the ACA for hosting us this evening. Thank you all. So we are very pleased to have this year's guest speaker, George Summers Jr. George is a fiber artist and founding member of Brick Bottom Artist Residence and Studios in Somerville, where he lives and works. He graduated with a BFA in illustration and design from UMass Dartmouth in 1981, completed an independent study in Batik, and has continued his arts education at the Museum School Boston. Over the past 30 years, Summers has had 10 one-person shows and has exhibited his work extensively in numerous groups shown around the country, most recently at the Queer Biennial Gallery held at Naval in LA in 2018. His boutique work is in many private collections, including the Tom of Finland Foundation, which recently received one of its boutique quilts as a gift. For 20 years, Summers managed the retail gallery for the Society of Arts and Crafts, which is the oldest nonprofits craft organization in the country. He currently maintain, maintains a studio practice at Brick Bottom, teaches boutique at the Brookline Arts Center, where he received the 2020 Berliner Award for 30 plus years of service, and he volunteers at Spoke, formerly Medicine Wheel Productions, which is an arts organization that utilizes art to heal and, and transform youth. Please join me in welcoming George Summers and festival director, April Rank. Um, George and I worked together at Society of Arts and Crafts. He had been there way before me. Uh, I came the last six years that they were brick and mortar. And uh, George was managing the retail gallery. And so I would be looking to pay bills <coughs> to artists, but I wanted to know, well, wait, what are we paying for? What did that artist do? So I'd come out and I'd ask George, show me so-and-so's work. I, I really want to learn about this. Well, that was just the beginning. It's, um, I learned about the artists that we carried. I learned about their history. I learned about how they related to other artists. I had a whole arts history lesson. And, and on top of that, uh, George would periodically go off to New York for special exhibitions and museum uh, shows. And, He'd come back and people at work would say, how was your weekend, George? And, and good, good. And I'd get my coffee on Monday morning and I'd wait until he settled in and I'd go, okay, what was your weekend <laughs> like in New York City this weekend, okay? And that's really when I learned that um, the oxygen that George breathes is art. And uh, I, I fell in love uh, with our conversations. So when we asked George to speak tonight, it's like we're going to just have another conversation like Just many, like the old days. Just like the old <laughs> days. But you guys will be able to hear. Uh, so, you know, I... And just, and just yeah. a side note about this is that I called April this week and I said, you know, I'm not a public speaker. I really have very rarely spoken in public, you know, in this fashion. Uh, the only time I've ever spoken in public is at a memorial service or a funeral. 
and I told her I did not want this to sound like a eulogy, so therefore, you know, I thought that this would be, you know, a nice way to, you know, uh, to do this. Yes. So. Yes. Just like our old conversations. Just like the old times, <laughs> but, but a little different. I never asked you about going to school at Dartmouth. Um, I mean, when you started school, did you know you wanted to study art? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I knew that. Uh, I've always known that. Mm -hmm. um, ever since I was a kid, I knew that I was going to be, well, I knew that I was going to be in the arts some way, somehow. I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to fall, but I, I knew that I was, I was going to have a life in the arts, mm -hmm. uh, come hella high water. Mm. I didn't know anything else, you know. Did you have good teachers in high school? I had an amazing teacher in high school. Um, she just recently passed away a couple of years ago, but she was the one who taught me how to batik. And one of the things that was uh, really instrumental about her was um, she had a family home up in Deer Isle, Maine. And so every summer she would go up to Haystack. And for those of you who are not familiar, Haystack is a uh, school, uh, a craft school up in Deer Isle. And she would go up every summer and she would take a course. <clears throat> well, she'd take a couple of courses. And this particular summer, she went up and she learned, uh, there was a group of artists from Africa who were teaching resist dye techniques. And so uh, she came back and she taught us how to batik. And uh, initially, you know, I was 13 years old and um, she taught us how to batik and I hated it. Oh. Um, and I was a typical 13-year-old. I hated everything, and usually 13-year-olds do hate everything. And uh, so she was very interesting. She, she <clears throat> took the batik that I did, and she folded it up, and she put it away. And then the following year, when I went back to high school as a uh, freshman, she pulled it out, and she had me look at it again. And just in that year, with you know, an attitude adjustment, or maybe, you know, I was looking at things differently, but I saw it and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Maybe I want to do some more of this. And, uh, and then I was hooked and that was it. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So you studied illustration though mm -hmm. at, at college. Why illustration? Uh, because you, you know, if I was going to do the batik, uh, you know, well, I studied illustration because, you know, I thought it was a way to make money. Okay, that's fair. Um, you know, and the, unfortunately in college, <laughs> at SMU, uh, UMass Dartmouth, I had a teacher who was, um, who formerly worked for Hallmark. Mm. And <laughs> so if your illustrations did not look like a Hallmark illustration, mm -hmm. you know, with bunnies and flowers and that sort of thing, um, uh, you didn't get an A. Uh, you got a B, but you, you, you know, to, in order to get an A, you had to have bunnies and flowers and all kinds of sweet things um, <laughs> happening in your illustrations. And of course, um, you know, being gay, I was, you know, I was, you know, I was putting all kinds of things in my illustrations and he was not the least bit impressed with that. <laughs> so uh, I didn't really, I didn't really enjoy illustration until I went to the museum school. And I went to the museum school and I had Joe Landry for uh, illustration. And, uh, you know, the thing about the museum school was that, uh, you know, where with you, Mars Dartmouth, and I don't know if they're the same way, um, but, you know, 35, 40 years ago, there was this student, you know, student teacher dynamic going on, you know, like, you know, like, do as I say, not as I, you know, oh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the museum school, and all of a sudden they're like, you know, no, you're an artist. You're an artist. You know, you're starting out your journey. My journey's already halfway down here, but you're an artist. And they started treating you like an artist. And so that was the best thing, you know. So Really encouraging you to kind of uh, explore mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. where, where you were going to go. Yeah. Yeah. So... And so your first job out of school in the arts field, what was that? 
Because you had to um, make money, right? <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Um, one of the things about artists, um, you know, I, I did a few jobs for like the Boston Globe and for the Harvard Review and, and everything. And, um, you know, I'm old school. So back in the day, you know, you'd work with art directors um, or editors or, or whatever. And you'd take your artwork in on a Friday and they would say, oh, this is great. This is really what I wanted. But can you change the color? <laughs> and, you know, and they would say it on a Friday afternoon and you'd think, oh, there goes my weekend, <laughs> you know? Um, and so... Because we weren't digital. Well, if you, right, if you had told me like 40 years ago that, you know, that you know, someday you'll be able to send the artwork through your phone or your <laughs> iPad and with a click of a button, you can change the color. Right. You know, I would have said, what are you smoking? And yeah, yeah. do you have, do you have more? I mean, <laughs> because, you know, that it, 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 I, was, I was entering the illustration field pre-digital. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I did that, but the, the fiber still called out to me. Um, and so I was doing that and I did, uh, I did some, uh, I did some production work with uh, the Batik. In fact, at one point in the 90s, I was actually working for a mail order tie company. So I would do yardage for them. And that was really a, a lovely job because they didn't give me any kind of restrictions. They were sort of Making like... Making men's ties. Yeah, they just said, you know, do anything. And so I did. I, I would just, you know, do yardage, lots of different yardage, and I'd send it to them, and then they'd make ties, and, you know, and they'd sell it on their mail order, you know, okay. uh, site. And so it was, it was a nice job and everything. They, they were in business for, I think, two or three years, and then uh, the couple broke up, and, well, that was the end of that. But, mm -hmm. but it was a nice mm -hmm. little gig to have. Um, so, you know... I, my my <clears throat> you know my jobs were always you know uh things to pay the rent so mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. it was <clears throat> everything from you know working retail to uh, cleaning office toilets three mm -hmm. nights a week mm -hmm. to um teaching college for a little while mm -hmm. you know just supplement your just real right Interest. Right, just so that I could just so that I could work, mm. and and most artists are like that, you know. Um, if you're if if you're an artist and you're doing your work, um, and you're doing it because you have to do it, there's no other way around it. You know, it's it's like combing your hair or brushing your teeth or whatever. Then you find all different ways to, you know, to to do it, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that means taking on odd jobs, and that means you know. Mm. Sometimes doing things you don't necessarily want to do, but you have to because it's paying for the studio rent or it's paying, you know, for mm. your, you know, your house rent or whatever. So when you were managing the retail gallery mm -hmm. at Society of Arts and Crafts, you'd go into New York, do the buying, you mm -hmm. know, shows and choose the artists that you wanted. Did you feel cheated because you weren't you know, you weren't making full time or you were like helping to support these people that were? No. Or, no? No, because, you know, I, you know, when I started working at the society, I was 40 years old. And <clears throat> my boss, who I had known for many years, said to me, you know, this freelance art business is, you're getting old and you need, <laughs> uh, you need, uh, you know, you need, you know, medical insurance and you need paid vacations and you need time off and you need all this stuff and you need a steady income. And so that was kind of the, the impetus to, you know, to get into, but it was still related. I mean, I mm -hmm. still felt like mm -hmm. I was doing something, you know, artistic. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say that I lived an artistic life, I mean that, you know, I was either looking at it making it, selling it, uh, you know, you know, it's just, it's all encompassing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel cheated. You know, I was still doing work, but the difference was, was that, you know, instead of doing, you know, 12 boutiques a year, I was doing three. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, so my output wasn't the same, mm -hmm. but I, I, did, I didn't feel cheated or, you know, I think this is something, you know, especially if you're a young student here, the, you know, don't ever compare yourself mm -hmm. um, to another artist and where they are on their journey, mm -hmm. um, because that is a creative killer right there yeah. um, if you're if you compare yourself to you know any other artist living or dead um, you know you're just you're you're always gonna be frustrated you're always gonna you know be on the losing you know you're, you're just never gonna be happy with that um, so it's really important that you understand where you are on your personal journey and you know and and go with that mm. so and the journey we talked about that. Um, you said that you've looked at your life uh, over the long haul and, and seen a life interrupted. What do you have to say about that? Well, because it's a lovely idea. You go to college, <laughs> you've got your, your degree, you're ready to get out and make a living. And well, but we are, our lives are interrupted, you know. I mean, I think we've all learned that, especially in the last couple of years, you know, mm. I mean, collectively as a society, our whole lives were interrupted a few years ago and we had no choice over it, mm. you know. Um, so, uh, you know, you will find at different times that, that you will be interrupted. Um, you know, whatever, whatever area of the arts that you're in, you know, and that, and that can be like, you know, job related, that can be, you know, family related, that can be, you know, health related. There's all kinds of interruptions along the way. Um, there's, no, there's no sort of, you know, avoiding that. Um, but at the same time, the other thing that should be noted is the fact that, you know, when a artist, be it a writer or a musician or a fine artist or whatever, um, when they are interrupted, <laughs> um, it's hard, you know, if you're going with the flow of something and then you're interrupted for a year, six months or a year or whatever, when you go back to that work, you know, it's never the same, mm. you know, because, you know, we, you, your initial flow with it, you know, is, is, you know, is what's carrying you to, to, you know, to, do your work to complete your work. And if that's interrupted, when you go back to it, however long it takes, uh, you know, when you go back to it, it's never quite the same because you're not the same. That's what I was about to say. You come back with, uh, as a different person. I, very much as so. As well, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I bet that's just increased when it's a longer period of interruption. Mm -hmm. It must be shocking. Have you ever had that happen where you know, I mean, you've not been working and then suddenly maybe, I mean, several years pass or have you never like let several years pass? Well, a... it depends on, you know, um, I, can, I can tell you one specific period um, between the late 80s, early 90s, there was a three or four year period there where I literally did no artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in relation to the AIDS epidemic. Okay. I was losing you know, all of my friends, you know, mm. uh, I was going to memorial services, you know, every week, every other week. Um, and so I was, you know, I was going through a period of what's the point, mm -hmm. you know, mm. um, you know, but, uh, you know, and then, and then feeling guilty about it, you know, like, well, you're still here. So why aren't you working, mm. you know? And uh, two things sort of got me back into working. One was uh, I, I took a writing workshop uh, with Erica Jong, uh, who wrote, for those of you who don't know, uh, she wrote a, she's a feminist writer, poet, uh, very popular in the 70s. Um, she wrote uh, Fear of Flying oh, and yes. How to Save My Own Life. Yeah. And, uh, was that here in Boston? Uh, no, she, that was in Connecticut. Okay. Um, she was, she, her daughter, who is, for those of you who don't know, for, the, for those of you who uh, read the Daily Beast or, you know, listen to podcasts or whatever, um, she's the mother of uh, Molly John Fast. And mm. Molly is a, a very, you know, astute writer, 
she's usually on CNN. Anyway, uh, Molly was one of my students at a creative arts camp that I was teaching at. And so Erica came and taught a workshop on writing. And so afterwards, I went to her and I said, you know, I've always wanted to keep a journal, but, you know, uh, I don't write. And she said, do it visually. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I could, I could do that. And, you know, I started doing, you know, keeping sketchbooks with, with collages or whatever, but I wasn't really, I didn't really dive totally into it until about a few years later. And I was still not really producing in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I met another person, uh, Robert Siegelman who taught at the museum school. And he's a well-known photographer, printmaker, you know. And so Bob, I was, you know, we were having dinner one night and I was bitching and complaining about, you know, I can't get into the studio, I'm not doing any work, da 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 da, -da you know, and everything. And the next thing I know, Bob sent me a uh, blank book and a and blank sketchbook. Yeah. And the, on the inside of the blank book, he said, um, carry this with you always. And even when you're not in the studio, the studio is with you. Mm. And so that really started me working again. And so, uh, so if, you're, if you're a student, um, I encourage you to always carry a sketchbook. Mm. Um, you'd be amazed at you know, what you unearth and find and, uh, and that was something that Erica Jong had mentioned when she was, you know, when she was giving the workshop, she had said that, you know, uh, she kept these books, uh, you know, that were very tactile. I mean, they were, you know, covered with, you know, business cards and cocktail napkins and everything. And, uh, but she, there were some pages where it was just one word written out on it. And so she said that what she does is she, carries the book all the time with her to lunches and dinners and whatnot. And someone will say something really, you know, kind of interesting and so she'll go, oh, that's an interesting, and she'll write it down. Mm -hmm. And so she said that when she started developing characters for her books, she would go back into her journals and she would look at her journals and she would read her journals and she would try to imagine conversations with her characters. So you never know what you're gonna find in a in a in an old sketchbook and you know at the time that you're doing it it may not seem like much of anything but you know 10 years down the road when you go back and you look at it again you may go ah oh, this is what i was looking for do you still keep your sketchbooks i i do i i i have about altogether i think 35 of them uh you know and i do keep it although you know, unfortunately, social media has really, <laughs> social media has become, in a way, it's become another way of documenting things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, but I, I still do keep a, keep a, a, a journal. I still keep a, a, a sketchbook, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But you, I, I know that you are very involved in social media. You're posting all the time. Things that you've seen in New York, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with murals and, and yeah, art, yeah, art yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not interested in showing you my dinner. Ah, oh, you're right. You know, right. I'm. Right. You know, I, I, I post and I try to post things that, you know, are going to be engaging, that are going to be thoughtful. Um, you know, I was in New York a week ago, and you know, and I came back and I just posted all the stuff that I saw, and. Uh, you know, I'm going to be in New York next week, and it'll be the same thing. Daily, I will be posting, you know, shows that I've seen, you know. So that's... What you've come across. In a way, you. that's like keeping a journal, too. Sure. Uh, it's just not a physical journal. Right. Um, but... So the journal experience triggered you to start working again. Yep. And was... What piece did you create after you came out of that hiatus that you really felt was complete and a really good piece of work. Did it take a while? It did, and it, and it came kind of by accident. Um, in 1999, I went to Italy for the first time, and I was very lucky. We, we had a, an apartment in Venice, 
uh, we were in Rome and we were in Florence and they were quite lovely. Um, but we, the, the thing for me was that we had an apartment in Venice and, uh, and in Venice there are St. Sebastians everywhere. You know, you walk down the street, there's a St. Sebastian. You go to a restaurant, there's a St. Sebastian. You go to the bathroom in the restaurant, and there's St. Sebastian. Um, there's St. Sebastian's everywhere. So when I came home, I, I had done some quick images <coughs> of St. Sebastian. And so I came home, and I actually did a batik. I did a large batik. And when I was looking for a title, I wasn't really familiar with St. Sebastian. I just knew that he was you know, half naked, and he had arrows sticking out of him. Um, I didn't really research him, and when I was researching, you know, like, you know, the life of St. Sebastian and, and what he was responsible about, um, I discovered that he was the patron saint against plagues. Huh. How appropriate, huh? And <laughs> so I really felt like, you know, in regards to the AIDS epidemic, mm. I felt like this was my, this was the piece that brought me that brought me out of that. Mm -hmm. nice. um, and it was the piece that I was working up to at that point mm -hmm. that would sort of, you know, that would sort of encompass that period of loss so and not does, working. And, right, right. And where does that St. Sebastian live now? In my kitchen, over the microwave. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I didn't know. I've, I've had a, I've had the opportunity to save it, uh, to sell it many times, and there are certain pieces that I will not sell. Well, that was um, like a transformative period, right? That you went through. There's, I have, I have two or three boutiques in my home, four boutiques in my in my place, uh, that they're they're mine, mm -hmm. that I, I can't get rid of because they speak of a particular period or a particular person or. You know, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't let, ever let that go because, right, know, that would be, yeah, that would be giving up too much of my history. Mm -hmm. A piece so. of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, are you still uh, volunteering at Medicine Wheel? Well, what I do at Medicine Wheel, I, I don't really, you know, volunteer in the traditional sense. I have done workshops there mm -hmm. in Batik. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I participate in their Day Without Art, December 1st, mm -hmm. um, which usually commemorates World AIDS Day. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my participation there. Um, I also go every year, we haven't gone the last three years because of COVID, but um, they, uh, every couple of years, they offer a trip to Italy. Uh, in the spring, and it's for anybody. Anybody can go, and it's a artist in residence uh, program. So basically, they put you up in a monastery, and for two weeks, you know, they take care of your meals, and then for two weeks, you are expected to go out and just do your artwork, mm -hmm. which is a real luxury mm -hmm. of not being interrupted. Mm -hmm. Getting back mm -hmm. to that word, mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that they do is from their student program. Uh, they bring one or two students for free mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and they get the opportunity and these are inner city kids some of whom have never been out of the country never been out of the state um, so for them to go you know to to Italy mm -hmm. you know is really Just, a sort of eye-opening you know experience and it's wonderful to watch them it's wonderful to look at them to, to sort of see them take it all in and then and then put it all out in their in their work mm -hmm. in their artwork mm -hmm. uh it's it's just it, it's it's a wonderful thing to watch i bet so so i bet watching coming back and seeing them uh and how it's affected them uh, and then continuing relationships with them i know that you've had a couple of mm -hmm. students that you've kept up with yeah the no I, I have a friend joshua who uh, I'm supposed to do dinner with him <laughs> next week at some point before I leave for New York. But um, you know, he you know he was a primary example. He uh, you know he was a student uh, you know at Medicine Wheel, and Medicine Wheel's motto is basically um, you know uh, healing through art. Mm -hmm. So originally, their mission in the '80s and the '90s was towards the um, the HIV/AIDS community. 
Um, and then when the drugs came in and leveled, you know, and sort of leveled the playing field in regards to AIDS, they realized that they needed to expand their outreach. And so then at the time, they, there was a big, and there still is to a certain degree, uh, opiate crisis mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Southie. And so they started expanding their, their focus on uh, inner city kids who are sort of latch, latchkey kids, you know, like mm. when they get out of school and, you know, their parents get home from work at seven, eight, nine, um, they're sort of, you know, free and available. Mm -hmm. And so what Medicine Wheel tries to do is it tries to engage them through uh, classes and workshops and art and that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, so that they don't end up, you know, on the streets and doing things that, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully mm -hmm. they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. So you've taught, you've taught art in college. Mm -hmm. You've also, you teach at Brookline mm -hmm. Adult Ed Center, and then also you mentor, <clears throat> you've experienced mentoring these kids um, at Medicine Wheel. It's like, how do you think that those experiences have changed your life? It's like, you, well, I'll be quiet. I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> How does it? Ch you know, I don't think of it in those. You know, I just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because there were people there for me. You know, coming up. You know, there was the you know Marjorie Weed, my high school art teacher, and in college I had Caroline Mills, who gave me independent study for five years because I wasn't a textile student. And in those days, they, you know, the, the departments were segregated. You know, if you, were, if you were a painting student, you didn't go into the ceramic studio or you didn't go to the photo studio. If you were a uh, fiber student, you didn't take illustration, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing illustration and design, you know, because I'm being practical, I need to make money, but I still wanted to do textiles. And so I had to get somebody to sign me up for uh, independent study. So along the way, there's always been somebody who has sort of helped me to the next level. And it's still happening today. Mm. You know, mm. I'm 64 years old, and yet there are still people who are, you know, you know taking my hand and saying, you know, come on, we, gotta, you know, we, we have to go this way now. <laughs> and, you know, so I'm just, I'm just paying it back. I'm just doing, I'm doing what, what I'm... I'm giving back what I'm getting, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm curious: Did you ever um, volunteer with uh, teaching art or uh, kind of mentoring art when you weren't doing art yourself? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I bet that was a different experience. Well, because because it, because you know teaching, you know, even though I wasn't doing it. I was still overseeing classes, you know, so I felt like I was still somewhat attached to it. I was still part of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, there was a part of me that was like, you know, you know, I really should be doing something. And then there was another part of me that was like, but you're not ready, mm -hmm. you know, and... That's a huge thing. I mean, when we were talking about having this conversation and planning, when you said, uh, these words keep sticking with me, a life interrupted, and I thought, I'm not an artist, but yet I've experienced these kind of interruptions as well. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to um, uh, lose confidence uh, and lose perspective that you'll be able to jump back in there and get back into, in, into whatever you want to pursue. And it's like, you know, what would you say to, to these students that are just getting ready to finish up school very soon? Okay, so for the students who are getting ready to finish school, um, the first thing that I would say is don't ever lose your curiosity. Mm. Don't ever you lose your uh, inquisitive nature. Don't ever lose your... Uh, don't ever lose your, your sense of, uh, you know, uh, learning, exploring, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, that's, 
you know, when you get to the point where you think you know everything, um, that's when you have to sort of pull back and, and you know, and sort of re recalibrate the whole experience of, you know, making and why you're in it and mm -hmm. why you're doing it. So I would say that's the, the first thing is, is never, never, ever lose your, your curiosity. And I think that that's one of the things that even when I wasn't working, I was still curious. Mm -hmm. So I never lost that, you know. Um, I never lost that, you know, and even now. I, I haven't, you know, uh, there's, there's still things to see, there's still things to learn, there's, you know, um, you know, and, and the other thing is ego, mm. you know, um, you know, uh, I, I have a little anecdote about, I, I do open studios with Brick Bottom, and, uh, you know, and uh, one of the things that I, you know, I, I don't really have an ego about this. You know, I just, you know, I do it, you know. And you like it, great. And if you don't, well, that's okay too, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, when you do open studios, people come into your studio and they'll tell you, you know, people are very like, you know, they'll tell you anything. They'll tell you everything, <laughs> you know. Um, and they'll come in and they'll say, oh, nice, I like how you painted your walls or, you know. You know, or your, I like your artwork, or, you know, nice colors, or, you know, and then you get the ones who come in and say, uh, you make a living at this, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, you, 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 you learn to, like, just sort of roll with it, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and not take it too seriously. Um, and <laughs> one time I had uh, a couple come into my studio, and it was a husband and wife, and the husband walked in and he said, oh, he said, fiber art, you know? <laughs> You know, like this. And the <clears throat> wife walked in and she looked around and she turned to him and she said, No! <laughs> and they walked out. <laughs> now, <Okay. laughs> if, if I had ego attached to that, that would have ruined my whole day. That would have ruined my whole day, my whole weekend. You know, I, would have, I probably would have closed the door and just sat there crying. Okay? <laughs> um, on my response to that, I got on social media and I said, oh my God, I've arrived. <laughs> Somebody just came in my studio, literally, you know, like, like you know, just stood there and, and you know, uh, you know, and thought, you know, kind of offended me, but I'm, I'm laughing about it. I mean, it was like hilarious. I, I really felt like, you know. You could survive <clears throat> that and. You know, like that was okay. It was, it was, it, 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 it was a funny incident to me because the ego wasn't involved, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, that's the other thing that I would suggest is don't, you know. Don't Curb get so the ego. Well, don't Build get so the serious, curiosity. You know, yeah. don't get so serious, mm -hmm. you know, um, because the journey is so much more pleasant, mm. um, you know. Well, George, do you have anything else you want to share that we've not talked about? The only, you know, um, We've talked a lot, um, but you know, this is what we did. In those, you know, we would we would sit there, you know, from seven or eight in the evening, and then it would be eleven thirty, and we'd have to get Ubers home. Um, um, you know, one of the things, getting back to you know, don't ever compare yourself to somebody. Um, I always remember a story. There was a story about. Um, David Vojanovitz, um, and I always butcher his name, so forgive me. Um, for those of you who don't know who David is, uh, they, he, they gave him a retrospective at the Whitney a few years ago, and he was a very prominent artist uh, in the 80s, uh, very political. He was sort of all over the map. <clears throat> um, he was a musician, a writer, a filmmaker, fine artist. I mean, he kind of did everything. Um, and he was having a studio visit with the artist uh, Zoe Leonard. And at the time, she was doing very small, tiny paintings of, you know, flowers and clouds and, you know. And she said to him, you know, uh, she said, uh, you're doing such important work, such great work, important work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I'm just painting flowers and clouds. Mm 
mm. and she felt very irrelevant, you know, in his company. Mm. And David said, no. He said, continue doing your flowers and your clouds and, you know, we need that. We mm. need that beauty in the world. Mm. And, you know, that's what we're fighting for. And so I thought, you know, that's the most wonderful gift that an artist can give another artist, you know, to tell them, you know, there's room at the table for you. you know? right. There's a great, I'm gonna end with this, I promise. Um, it's a quote by Kiki Smith. And Kiki Smith is? Kiki Smith is, uh, she is another one of those artists who does everything. I mean, she, uh, you know, I saw a, a show of hers in uh, Florence a couple years ago. Um, she's, you know, she's done clay installations, glass installations. She's known for her printmaking. Um, she's, she's really, really a, a very versatile, you know, artist. And, uh, and if you don't know who she is, Google, because, you know, Google's your best friend. And she's from the U.S.? She's, yes, her father was um, uh, Tony Smith, um, who, very well-known um, sculptor oh, okay. out of Yale. Okay. Um, so Art she, historian, too. So she comes from a background. She comes from that background. But it's a great quote. I saw it not too long ago, and this is where I'm going to end it. Just do your work, and if the world needs your work, it will come for you, and it will get you. If it doesn't, do your work anyway. You can have fantasies about having control over the whole world, but I know I can barely control my kitchen sink. That is the grace I'm given, because, once, because when you can, tr can control things, one is limited to one's own vision. Mm. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. So AIFF has had the privilege. Sorry, we're good. All right, AIFF has had the privilege of partnering for the sixth year with Robert Maloney, professor of illustration of Mass College of Art and Design. For those of you joining us for the first time, Bob incorporates the poster assignment as part of the curriculum in his experimental illustrations techniques course. A Boston area native. Professor Maloney is a graduate of Mass Art with a concentration in illustration and a graduate of Mass Art's low residency graduate program. As a working artist, he creates multimedia pieces that are influenced by the many layers of the urban landscape. His recent work often focuses on the connections between the temporary materials of our man-made structures and how these forms relate to the fragility of our memories. Bob's mixed media artwork and installations have been featured in numerous galleries and arts, arts publications, and his works are in private collections nationally and internationally. Welcome, Bob, for the sixth year. So. so we hope you've all had the opportunity to take a look at the poster designs submitted this year. I absolutely love them, and if you haven't gotten the chance to look at them, please make sure you do before leaving today. So now let's meet the artists. Please hold your applause until they're all on stage. And artists, as I call your names, please come up and forgive me if I mispronounce them. Uh, Alex Lewis, Ariana Stoughton, Sa Faye Sylvia, sorry, Jamie Reinhold, Larry Bousquet, Lexi Gumas, Lynn Jeffrey, Luke Donahue, Marissa Mazzoni, Madeline Gutierrez, Salvatore Spaco, Sandra Kalajian, Taylor Adams Be uh, Bass, Vanessa Kraps, Vicky Chen, Vivian Wirtorski. So 
you all have created seriously wonderful pieces of art. And so let's all join in a round of applause for the artists and their posters. So the poster contest entries were evaluated by an esteemed panel of judges with expertise in composition, design, public relations, and marketing. The selected poster design will become the face of this year's festival and will appear on prints, TV, and web promotions locally, nationally, and internationally. The poster contest judges were Elisa Adams, a stone sculptor and president of New England Sculptors Association, David Ardito, a visual artist and interim K-12 director of visual arts for the Arlington Public Schools. Jennifer Cheng des Hotels, illustrator, logo, designer, and plein air artist. Mark Gurton, the owner of 13 Forest Gallery, a, co a contemporary art and craft gallery located in East Arlington. Erica Lysia Kane, a working artist and retired college studio art instructor. Elena Mathis, a senior at Mass College of Art and 2021 winner of the AIFF poster contest. Agatha Piaz, the 2019 winner of the Elche International Independent Film Festival in Spain, which is our new festival partner. And Vicky, Rodrigu Vicky Rodriguez, artist and arts administrator for the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Judges, thank you all for sharing your expertise with us. And if you are here tonight, please stand for a round of applause. And now, the one we've all been waiting for, the unveiling of the winning poster. For this, please welcome Arlington International Film Festival organizers, April Rank and Alberto Guzman.
Thank you all so much for joining us today and celebrating the art of illustration with everyone. This officially launches the 2022 Arlington International Film Festival, and we hope to see you at the Capitol Theater November 3rd to 6th for amazing independent films. We end this evening's program with Carl Romero on guitar again, and thank you all, and have a wonderful night.